I'm going to start the recording now then. So off you go then, if you want to. Um... It's huge paper. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, obviously, for coming in to listen to me talk this evening. It's a pleasure to be here. It is obviously strange because the last time I met some of you, and forgive me if I don't remember you, um, but the last time I met some of you, it was, it was in real life. It was at the club itself. Um, and actually, on that occasion, I was a stand-in for somebody else. And on this occasion, I am actually a stand-in again for somebody else. So I think next time I won't be a stand-in. I will be the original program, yeah. hopefully. Um, but thank you for having me. It's a very interesting way to, to see everybody, um, particularly for, for camera clubs and photographic societies now, but it's becoming the new norm. Uh, and it's also quite easy to do now. So hopefully the rest of the evening should go fairly smoothly. Um, we've been doing these as a, as a company now since March, and we've got quite well versed at using the technology as you can see we we try to look as good as we can for anybody that is interested i am actually being filmed this evening on an olympus omd on an em1 mark ii and a 17 mil 1.2 lens so obviously there are webcam capabilities of the cameras as well and that's one of the first things uh, that would be interesting to to tell you about this evening now hopefully for the first half, uh, I'm planning to give you a, a small presentation. Some of you may have seen a few bits of it before. It's about the history of the company and the innovations of the tech, but we'll give you a little bit of a reminder. And then we'll move forward into showing you the most current models of the OMD range that are available. So what you can expect uh, to see in terms of equipment from Olympus, right through from the entry level up into the Pro, uh, Pro Series as well. Then obviously the small tea break, uh, and we'll come back and we'll have a little look at some live demonstrations. And this evening, uh, it was requested that I show you some more of the macro facilities on the, uh, the Olympus cameras. So I'm going to hopefully show you how some of the macro equipment works, the kit, uh, the lens and the, and the cameras. Uh, and then a secondary demonstration on how that works with some of the flash options as well. So uh, let's go and let me find the share screen option and let me share my presentation. Hey, David, with you. just a minute. Um just going to mute everybody so you have to unmute yourself. Oh, but, no problem. Oh, I, I can't do it now because you've gone to share screen. But that for you there, then. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm muting all. all. Uh, if you need to interrupt, just press your space bar. Of course. Uh, thanks, Alan. And of course, um, throughout the evening, if you do have any questions, and I absolutely welcome them. If you're an Olympus user and you're curious about how that affects your kit, uh, ask me a question. If you're not an Olympus user and you're curious about uh, how that compares to something you've already got, then of course, uh, you know, you just jump in and sort of say uh, that you've got a question. I'm more than happy to help. If you don't feel comfortable jumping in throughout the presentation, obviously at the end, I'm going to open that up to a little Q&A so you can jot it down uh, or remember your question and then ask me before we do the break as well. And that'll be, um, that'll be good. The more you uh, interact, the better the evening is for, for both me and for you. Or if you want, you can use the chat facility. That would be open. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, I'm going to pop up my uh, presentation now. David, David, can I break in now? Of course you can, George, yeah. Right, uh, it probably won't matter at this stage, but right behind your uh, right hand here, here, that left hand looking from my side, you've got a white spot. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> was it was it distracting you? That's actually the reflection yes, from my from my studio. Well, I, I, I thought actually, it... I can change that. There we go. We'll take that down. That's a that's a voice recorder. I think it's gone now. Yeah, there we go, George. It's gone now. Okay. <laughs> As a voice recorder screen, let's move that along. Uh, okay, so let's look at uh, uh, getting all this going for you. Here we go. So let's see. Uh, let me just move things around so that I can actually see my own slides as well. So welcome to the presentation. The presentation is, of course, No Limits Break Free. Uh, the system is designed for mobility, hence why we call it the Break Free Campaign. Uh, and my details are just down there at the bottom. I am David Smith. I'm a lead product specialist for Olympus UK. Uh, I've been with the company now for just a little over eight years. Uh, feels like only yesterday when I started working for the company. So it's gone very, very quickly. My contact details are there, david.smith at olympus.co.uk, and they will pop up at the end as well. If anyone's got any questions, then feel free to email me at any time. Okay, let's have a little look at the history of the company. Here's a quote that some of you might remember if I told it to you last time I was physically in the club. This is from a man called Yoshihisa Matani. 
and he was the R&D developer and designer for the original OM range of cameras and many other models as well. He said that the object of photography is to express what is in your heart and mind and technique is nothing more than an intermediary of that expression. No matter how automated we make cameras, automation will not place limits on the photogra uh, photographer's activities, rather it will expand them. And that's something that we try and hold true to today is that we put lots of exceptional features uh, into the camera that make them a very powerful machine, but ultimately they are tools to assist the photographer's uh, um, mind and their perception of their own imagery. Uh, and that was from Yoshihisa Matani. So little bits of pub trivia. The company was named Olympus for the Greek mountain and home of the gods. Uh, why they didn't call themselves Fuji before Fuji called themselves that we don't know. <laughs> after Mount Fuji, but they called themselves Olympus. Uh, and that, they called themselves that in 1949, but the company uh, was actually uh, started in 1918. But they called themselves Olympus uh, to reflect their strong aspiration to create high quality world famous products. Uh, and a lot of this pub trivia is pub trivia that you'll never get asked in a pub quiz. Um, the line before, uh, below our logo, which you can see in the top left corner of your screen there, is called the Opto Digital Pattern. And that logo is designed to represent both light and boundless opportunities. It's a very Japanese concept, uh, as you might imagine. There is the man himself. That is Yoshihisa Matani with the Asahi 600 times microscope, because of course, Olympus don't just make cameras. In fact, cameras are only a small part of the Olympus business, whereas everything uh, predominantly is circled around the medical and scientific uh, sectors. Photomax industrial research microscopes were one of the biggest developments that we've made in terms of scientific research. Uh, and lots of other products that, of course, we will remember from the days of film cameras. Now, Yoshihisa Matani was the original designer of the OM series of, of cameras, so much so that the name of the camera is uh, from his own name. OM stands for Olympus Matani. Uh, and of course, today, OMD stands for Olympus Matani Digital. Lots of different products throughout the years, uh, not only things like the Olympus E1, which was our first stabilized four-third system, uh, but also things in the medical sector, such as the Olympus Endo capsule. Uh, and we actually had this on show at the last physical photography show that was held. So it wasn't this year, sadly, because that was that was cancelled and created virtually. Uh, but last year's physical photography show in Birmingham, we featured a lot of our products in a glass case. And you would have seen if you went there, the Olympus Endo capsule. And it's a small pill with a camera inside it that when swallowed will film the entire journey through the patient's digestive tract. Uh, all the way through to the inevitable end. And uh, it's been used in many, many situations, but primarily to diagnose serious, uh, potentially fatal disorders. So it is a bit of a lifesaver. Uh, and it's one of the, the greatest uh, inventions of the last 10 years from Olympus. So just to give you an idea of some of the innovations across photography that Olympus have brought in, and a lot of these will be present on other manufacturers' cameras now uh, because they've be become something that we've come to rely on. Uh, and a lot of people don't know that they started in an Olympus system. So, of course, back in the day, we had the Pen F, which was the world's first half frame interchangeable lens camera. And what that meant was that you could put a roll of film in there and actually get twice as many images out of it than you would do from a standard camera. So putting a roll of 36 film into a Pen F would result in 72 images, much to the person cutting those images in the development room, uh, much to their distaste, because obviously you wouldn't know that the film was taken on a Pen F until you opened it up and realized that you had twice as many images images to cut. We had the Olympus Auto Eye, which was the first ever shutter priority system where you could prioritize the shutter speed of the, of the camera. The Olympus Pen EM as the first electric camera. Of course, the OM1, uh, so named after uh, Mr. Matani himself, uh, the world's smallest fully featured 35mm SLR system. And the Mu10, which was the first metal bodied compact with weatherproofing. Now, there is a story that goes along with why we developed the Mu10, which was our first uh, compact with weatherproofing. And that, again, it comes back to Yoshihisa Matani, where ultimately he was sitting in a Japanese bathhouse, which was quite the tradition and still is to this day uh, for uh, Japanese businessmen uh, to go to before they went home for their dinner. They would stop at a bathhouse 
clean themselves from the day's work before going home to their family. And he was sitting in a bathhouse one day when a truck driver stopped outside the bathhouse for his bath before he went home. Now, the truck driver left his truck running, thinking he was going to be a very quick in and out uh, of the bathhouse. While he was in there, the truck's engine spontaneously combusted. It burst into flames and the whole truck uh, was on fire. Uh, this resulted in several very naked Japanese men running out of a bathhouse with buckets of water trying to put the truck out. And the one thing that Yoshihisa Matani thought at the time was, wow, I wish I had a camera with me for this, because that's quite a picture. Now, of course, he didn't have a camera because he was in a bathhouse. It was a hot, uh, humid, wet environment where you wouldn't take a camera. So he went back to the office the next day and started working on uh, weather sealing for compacts and came up with the mutant. Uh, that to this day has now led us on to what we have in terms of our tough range and we're on the current generations of tough which is a tg6 of course live view function is now something that we take for granted yeah. and the e330 was the world's first full-time live view function camera uh, so that is the camera that all of this was born on and now every manufacturer has the opportunity to have a live view function We've got the world's first supersonic wave filter. Now, that is a vibrating device uh, fitted to the sensor that vibrates at, at, on the Olympus system up to 30,000 times per second uh, to remove dust from the sensor. And that's something that is now, again, fitted into many other manufacturers' lenses as well. Uh, sorry, cameras. Uh, the E3 at the time of release was the world's fastest AF system and of course we released the world's smallest and lightest interchangeable lens cameras with the pen range of micro four thirds cameras. That was 12 years ago. We had and still have the world's first 1.8 fisheye lens, that's the Pro 8mm 1.8 fisheye lens, and we introduced the SP100EE, which was the first 50 times zoom bridge camera with a red dot sight that then led onto the creation of the EE1, which is a separate dot sight that could be fitted onto any camera. Very useful for when shooting at super telephoto distances to maintain the user's peripheral view uh, and therefore not lose the subject that you're tracking. Incidentally, if you decided that now was the time to buy an EM1X, the EM1X does come with a free EE1 laser dot sight. Of course, Olympus is famous for its stabilization system and we created the world's first five axis image stabilizer. We're now uh, up to stabilizers that provide many stops worth of stabilization and a lot of other manufacturers have more basic versions in their systems. That's the man himself in his younger years, Yoshihisa Matani, sadly no longer with us. He was 1933 to 2009, uh, very well revered among uh, uh, the people in our company. Of course, we've had a cult following. There's some famous people that have used Olympus cameras. Uh, Eugene, w. Eugene Smith, Patrick Litchfield, David Bailey, of course. Who is he? I don't know. Uh, and of course, James Bond, as the OM4 was in the title uh, the movie titles for uh, James Bond's uh, Goldfinger. So before I uh, carry on, that's the kind of very gentle history lesson of the camera, uh, of, of, of the company. Uh, now, obviously at this stage, more than happy for anybody to uh, kind of chip in, reach out, ask any questions about uh, about the company as a whole, how we've kind of developed the system and things like that. And it's, it's really just an excuse for me to take a little drink of my tea. Do you want to say anything about the, the fact that the um, camera division is now being sold? Absolutely. <laughs> that was an opening for that one, really, wasn't it? Uh, so the camera division is in the process of being transferred and negotiations are underway. As far as we know, the statements that have been released so far is that a company called JIP, which is a Japanese investment company, will be taking 95% uh, stocks of Olympus as of January the 1st, should all go well. Uh, everything is looking very positive from our point of view. They've released some very interesting statements about moving forward uh, with the new products and the new system. Uh, sorry, the, the existing system, but with new products moving forward. So it all looks quite exciting. Uh, interestingly, there are lots of different versions of what's going on out there on the internet, uh, but obviously from straight from the horse's mouth is that there should be no change. It's the imaging division only of Olympus that's being sold over. Uh, but that means hopefully we'll have lots of extra research and development coming into play 
in previous years, we've done huge amounts of research, but all of it has had to somehow benefit the medical and scientific community first, because first and foremost, 85% uh, of Olympus's business is in medical and scientific. So everything that the camera division went to research had to benefit those. Now moving out as solely an imaging division arm, hopefully all of the research will be dedicated to photographic technologies. Uh, but it's looking very positive. Just in terms of uh, research, that the expertise that obviously Olympus has, has had, uh, and you know, is the uh, are those specialists going with the, you know into the new company, as it were? Absolutely. So the uh, it's, it's an excellent question as well because a lot of people have been asking about the research uh, team, about the service and repair department, and things like that. Uh, and JIP have bought everything. So they've bought service and repair, they've bought research and development, they've bought manufacturing, uh, and they've bought divisional uh, sections such as ourselves here in the UK as well. Everything is going as a whole. Sounds good. Good. Excellent. Thanks for your question, Keith. That was brilliant. And, uh, and good to get that out of the way, because normally people hang on to that one till the end because they don't really want to ask it. So well done. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so let me move on now to telling you a little bit uh, about the cameras themselves, what's available right now. And actually, the slides that I'm about to show you are even still slightly out of date because this starts me on the entry level uh, and it starts me on the OMD EM10 Mark III. Uh, now, we're up to the, uh, the EM10 Mark IV now. That's the newest generation, but there are many, many similarities. But as I go through, I'll kind of tell you the differences that have come up from the Mark IV anyway. So let's have a quick look at this. Of course, all of the cameras that we make are luxurious, but this particular one is small and light. It's very tiny. I've got some weight measurements for you in just a second. Uh, ultimate OMD image quality, of course, with five axis image stabilization built in as well built-in Wi-Fi that all the cameras have now. Every single one of our cameras has built-in Wi-Fi now. And there is a redesigned user interface. So as an entry-level camera, this was redesigned to be much more simple to use uh, for people just either coming into the system as new or beginning in, ph in photography in general. And a beautiful 2.36 million dot OLED viewfinder. So the OLED viewfinders are really nice, particularly if you wear polarized glasses, because OLED isn't affected by the polarization uh, as a TFT LCD screen is. Just a quick example here of the speed of the autofocus as it follows that uh, that screw just there on the on the branch. Um, there are a lot of cool things about the EM10 Mark III that have been changed from the EM10 Mark II, and those also follow through to the Mark IV as well. Uh, those things are labeled buttons. So every single button has been labeled so that as you come into the system and new, those buttons are marked so you know exactly where you're going. And you've also got a nice shortcut button that's been added, and it's a shortcut to everything. No matter what mode you're in, if you press the shortcut button, it takes you to the primary menu options for that mode, which is really, really good. A quick example here of uh, stabilization. Of course, without stabilization, you're going to get a blurred image. And the, uh, the photo on the right there is with the stabilization in the camera. Now, the EM10 Mark IV has four and a half stops of stabilization. Uh, and I can give you a little demonstration later on what that means in real terms. Uh, some of you will know what the terms of stops of stabilization means. Uh, some of you won't. So I'll give you a, a brief explanation later on. All that obviously transfers over to video as well. So you've got five axis stabilization in video uh, where you can go from full HD, which is 1080 uh, up to 4K at 30p, but also with options of high speed movies. So it will shoot in 120 frames per second, resulting in a slow motion movie. And you can create clips that can be built together in camera as well. So very flexible. The advanced photo mode is only on the EM10 series of cameras, and that's where all of our really kind of exceptional features such as focus bracketing, keystone compensation, lifetime long exposure, all those kind of things where normally on the other models, you have to go into the menus a little bit and do some parameter programming. They're all made very, very easy to use in the AP mode. We're now actually up to 16 art filters. The latest art filter is an instant film art filter. Now, art filters are something that people either love or they hate. Uh, but for those that are beginners or those that want to use an entry-level camera, and particularly those that don't feel comfortable shooting raw and want to have some extra creativity, these are really, really useful. 
touch screen AF shutter. You touch on the screen wherever you touch, whatever subject you're touching on the screen, that's where the focus will lie. And the camera benefits from 121 autofocus points with full face and eye detection. On the EM10 Mark IV, there's a new face and eye detection algorithm, which is super fast. And the camera benefits from continuous AF up to 8.7 frames per second. Once you go through the EM10 range, that's the entry level, that's the start of the OMD system. Then you move into the mid range, which is the EM5. Now, historically, the EM5 was actually the first OMD ever created. It was the revolution. It was the EM5 Mark I, the first OMD camera in the range. Uh, and that sort of, if, we, if it wasn't for that camera, we wouldn't kind of be where we are today. We're now up to the current generation, which is the EM5 Mark III, and it's a superb camera. Massive improvement since the EM5 Mark II in many, many ways. It's becoming very, very close uh, to its sibling, the EM1. There are some di dimensions for you. It's a tiny camera in comparison to what it does. So you're looking at weighing in 366 grams. It's superbly lightweight, uh, slightly smaller battery than its predecessor, uh, but actually more power efficiency in that smaller battery. So uh, you get a few extra shots in there and SEPA tested on this one to 340 shots. However, it does depend how you use the camera. Now SEPA testing is an interesting one. Uh, we have to legally say what they provide in terms of the values for that testing on the camera, which for this one is 340. Personally, my use of this camera has got a lot more shots out there. I'll be looking at more like 550 to 600 on that battery. But again, it depends on how you use the camera. Uh, you can actually also experience less than that if you do a lot of sort of chimping on the back screen or things like that. It also depends on the features that you use the most as well. So this uses a BLS50, which is uh, the same battery as the EM10. Uh, oh, sorry, 310 shots, not 350 shots on this one, but 110 minutes uh, of movie time as well. Uh, and one of the biggest improvements from the EM5 Mark II to the three is in-body USB charging. OK, so that's charging the battery in camera. It's not operational use uh, as you get with some of the pro models, uh, but it is in camera charging. So if you're on the go and you've got a power bank, you can just pop it into your bag, hooked up to the camera uh, and it will charge away. Uh, we've got adapters, obviously, so that you can use them in uh, the cigarette light sockets in the car. Um, and it's got an AC adapter as well, should you need it. Now, another huge change from the previous EM5. So this is 121 points autofocus system, but they're all cross type, which they weren't on the previous model. And they are phase and contrast detect, which they weren't on the previous model. So the previous EM5, the Mark II, was contrast detect only. And as such, you probably wouldn't have chosen it for a sports or wildlife camera uh, because as much as it was very quick, it probably wasn't as quick as you would want it to be in those situations. Now, the addition of phase detect onto that as well is bringing it in line with the EM1 series, which was built uh, to support wildlife and sport shooting. So again, that's opening up this camera to a whole other genre of, of, of photography. You've got many, many grid point uh, options in there as well. So you can change your targets from a single point, five, nine, and 25. You can select all 120 points for cluster tracking or a precise point if you're doing macro and fine work as well. You've got control over the sensitivity of the autofocus and also control over the low light performance, which in this camera, using the 1.2 lenses, is capable of a shooting down to minus six EV. The camera benefits from five axis stabilization at five and a half stops of stabilization. Uh, six and a half if it's combined with a sync IS enabled lens, which would be something like the 12 to 100 F4 or the 300 millimeter F4. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about stabilization at this point and why we talk about it in steps for those of you that don't know. Ultimately, what that means is that we have something called the reciprocal rule that some of you may know about. And it talks about using uh, a minimum shutter speed based on the focal length of your lens on the camera. So let's say, for example, in 35 millimeter terms, if you're using a 300 millimeter lens, then you would want to use at least 300th of a second or faster to enable a sharp shot. And that's the general rule. With the stabilization, it means that you can actually slow that shutter speed down five and a half or six and a half stops slower than what that reciprocal rule uh, suggests. Uh, 
So ultimately in the Olympus cameras, every click of the shutter wheel will slow that down by a third of a stop. So for five stops of stabilization, you're going 15 clicks slower than you think you should. And I'll show you that in action when we do the demonstration in the second half. Just a quick uh, point on um, ISO performance, and this is because of the difference in the processor. So the EM5 Mark II run on a Trupic 7 processor, and the EM5 Mark III runs on a Trupic 8. And what you're seeing here is that the EM5 Mark III, the newest generation, performs as good, if not slightly better, at ISO 6400 than the previous generation did at ISO 1600. So that's a massive improvement for the noise based on processor change alone. And of course, it benefits from that OLED screen, 2.36 million pixel OLED screen with an increased eye point. So this has an eye point of 27 millimeters, which to some people will mean absolutely nothing. But as a spectacle wearer, 27 millimeters eye point is really important for comfort of using that viewfinder with your glasses on. And of course, movie options, because movie has to be put into every camera now. There's no manufacturer now that can produce a camera that doesn't have those movie options. And the EM5 Mark III has a lot of options in there, many more than the EM10. You can shoot up to cinema 4K, which is true 4K at 24 frames per second. Uh, it also has a flat mode option for muted colors where you can then take your uh, movie and color grade it in post editing. Uh, a built-in microphone jack, uh, and improved autofocus uh, performance from through the newest algorithms as well. And of course, we've got that dust reduction system, the supersonic wave filter that is an Olympus innovation. Uh, it has the same coating on the sensor as the EM1X, which stops dust sticking to the surface primarily, but then the supersonic wave filter will kick in and throw off any dust that has stuck to it as well. Of course, there we go, Wi-Fi in every single model now, Bluetooth in this one as well, which allows for automatic transfer of JPEGs or RAW. And what you can actually do with the Bluetooth is you can use it to wake up the camera. Again, if the camera's in your bag, if you don't want to take it out because you might be in an area where it's perhaps not safe to take out a camera, uh, you can wake it up with the Bluetooth from your phone and you can begin transferring files from the camera to the phone whilst the camera's in your bag. Okay. Uh, once again, that's, uh, that's our mid-range model. Uh, so at this stage, uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions based on the EM5's current generation. Brilliant. That means my slides are really self-explanatory, which is really good. Of course, if you do have any questions that come up throughout, uh, just pop them to me at the end and I'm more than happy uh, to carry on answering. <coughs> excuse me okay we're about half an hour in so i've probably got about another uh, another 15 minutes of this before uh before we break uh before the live demonstrations or allow that q a to open up so let me go ahead and uh, tell you a little bit about the em1 mark three <coughs> now the em1 mark three uh superb superb camera it is the one that i'm using the most at the moment out of all of the cameras even above uh the em1x So what is the EM1 Mark III? Well, it's kind of the best of a couple of different worlds. It's an evolution of the EM1 Mark II, which was compact and lightweight with massively high speed performance. And we've taken a lot of the air technology from the EM1X and put it into that smaller foot form of a body. Um, now, the reason that we've done this is because we wanted to be able to offer two exceptionally powerful machines, the EM1X, obviously, but that's got the larger footprint uh, and the EM1 Mark II, which has the smaller portability to it. It has, at the moment, currently the world's best image stabilization with a gyroscope that was designed and developed for the EM1X. Now, the gyroscope that was designed and developed for the EM1X was also designed for something else, which I'll tell you a little bit about later on. But what that does mean is that it allows the body to perform up to seven stops of, of five axis uh, stabilization and up to seven and a half stops synchronized with those compatible lenses as well which ultimately means that you can run with this camera and take a sharp shot uh, it's quite phenomenal to experience we've got a new processor in there this is the Trupic 9 imaging processor and that allows for some phenomenal features uh, that we'll come on to a little bit later on including the handheld high res and the live nd features as well so handheld high resolution shooting, what is that? Ultimately, it's a sensor shift 
feature. The camera uses its stabilization system in reverse, and instead of holding the sensor stable, it moves it around uh, in a handheld version uh, up to 16 times to capture more data. So ultimately, you're going from shooting a 20 million pixel uh, se uh, sensor resolution image to being capable of shooting a 50 million pixel handheld shot or an 80 million pixel high resolution shot. We've also built in live neutral density. So uh, as much as you can also carry around those neutral density glass filters around with you as well, you have the capability to use up to ND32 in camera digitally. Uh, and that's a five stop ND filter built in before you need to apply any glass. Of course, the ergonomics of the system have always been amazing. Uh, there's an excellent grip system that's been designed through pro photographers uh, and redesigned to include things like the joystick and the FN lever button. Weather sealing, absolutely fantastic. Probably the best in the industry at the moment. There are over 60 seals on this model alone that maintain the weather sealing of the camera with a full magnesium alloy body uh, which is creating that lightweight basis for all of the technology that's built in there. Now, this camera then develops USB charging as well as obviously the EM5 and the EM10 have, but you can also power the camera if you have the correct power delivery device. So USB PD or power delivery is a form of power bank that can deliver the right voltage to the camera to not only charge it when it's off, but operate the camera when it's switched on as well. Uh, and this camera has the ability to do that. The supersonic wave filter built into there, again, 30,000 times per second vibration to kick any dust off there. Uh, and towards the end of the presentation, I've got some more useless pub trivia that will tell you a little bit more, more about that. Uh, a shutter that is uh, rated for 400,000 actuations, so the same as the EM1X. And for those of you that do have an Olympus system, uh, I get a lot of questions about using electronic shutter and does it affect the rating for the shutter unit? And no, it doesn't. So if you're using the electronic shutter that has no impact on the lifespan of the camera, uh, only the mechanical shutter actuations will be affecting that 400,000 actuations. Uh, the ability to program four custom modes and a really nice simple control panel mode that's been added into there as well, which is basic shooting information. Uh, and this is something that the pro photographers asked for. It's a nice, simple, traditional style view. Of course, EM1 series gets dual card slots. Now, the top slot in here, slot card number one, uh, will allow for UHS-2 compatible memory cards, and those are the fast buffering memory cards that are available at the moment. Slot two will take a UHS-1 compatible memory card as well, uh, and there are many different uh, regu uh, regulator formats for both of those memory card slots, so you can save uh, RAW, JPEG, or a combination of the two in there as well. Of course, we've added a joystick, which is one of the most fantastic things added into the EM1 series. So nice and handy to navigate through your AF points uh, and also through the menus as well. 4121 all cross type on chip phase and contrast detection sensor, which is a super high accuracy AF system. Uh, and a whole bunch of AF targeting modes from single 5.9 point, 25 point, 121 point and very fine points as well. But we've also added the additional custom AF target mode where you can build and create your own uh, AF grids uh, on size and shape as well. Tracking and speed. The EM1 series are capable of 18 frames per second when tracking and 60 frames per second when in sequential lock shooting or single AF. And this is the only model that has the latest Starry Sky autofocusing feature as well, which is a fantastic feature for grabbing those night sky scenes very, very quickly. I've mean, used it myself quite recently for some astrophotography. Um, it's a phenomenal feature. We're hoping something that will move into other models, but we haven't been told officially yet. They've improved the face priority um, algorithms in the camera, and they've also applied a face selection feature so that if there are many faces within a scene, you can actually use the face selection button to choose which face you would want the uh, face priority system to lock onto. And of course, uh, 4K movie shooting uh, 
in all of the cameras is an absolute necessity. And this is up to cinema 4K, as you see there. You've now got the ability to use something called OM Log, which takes flat mode in video even further and creates a Log 400 mode. And again, this is for creating uh, color grading opportunities in post edit for movie. And the camera is capable of high speed movie at 120 frames per second for high quality slow motion. You've got a HDMI output connection on this uh, that you can add an external monitor. And we have just released uh, information that we are developing uh, raw movie mode with Atomos, which is a, an external monitor uh, manufacturer. And of course, we do make audio recorders as well with an LSP range. So you can get high res better than CD audio with your, uh, with your movies as well. Pro Capture, something that Mary has just basically uh, told us about that that amazing photograph uh, that she scored with just there. Pro Capture uh, is the time machine feature, the, the feature that retroactively collects images before you press the shutter. So it is virtually impossible to miss the shot that you wanted. Uh, and ultimately, it is true. It is like a little time machine in the camera uh, by buffering up images uh, as you half press the shutter. Uh, without any blackout on your subject. And one of my favorite modes, the live composite mode, the light painting mode, or the long exposure modes. Live composite, live bulb, and live time are all excellent, uh, very exclusive features to Olympus, where some manufacturers are only just coming on to understand how they work. Uh, and this is basically, again, real-time viewing of long exposure images on the camera. Focus stacking and focus bracketing, something that we're actually going to look at today in the demonstration later on uh, in a small setup that I've got just here. So you, the camera is capable of focus stacking in camera to produce a final image or focus bracketing up to 999 images at different focal points that can be then stacked together in external software. Okay, before I move on to the EM1X, if anyone has any questions about the EM1 Mark III, do please feel free to ask. David, why do you prefer the EM13 to the M1X? What is it about it? It's because, oh, it's a great question. It's because of my macro work, because I like a smaller body, because I end up going down the woods and crawling underneath bushes. Um, and the EM1 uh, Mark III, I can get closer to the ground with it because it doesn't have the built-in grip system. As much as the EM1X is phenomenal, and if I was to be, if I was shooting more wildlife uh, and sports than I was macro, I would choose the X over that because of the, the the balance on the body with the bigger lenses. But when I go out and shoot with a 30 mil and a 60 mil macro lens that it ultimately are tiny, then the Mark, the EM1 Mark III, and the two was the one, but now the three, uh, it's just suit, more suitable to the genre of photography that I'm shooting. There is nothing that the X adds into my sort of macro style of shooting that I don't get from the three. And, and I can scoop closer to the ground, basically. David, David you mentioned about the, um, the Starry Sky uh, facility, and you said that it would probably be put into other models. Would that be through a software update or would it be from models from now onwards? Well, we're not sure. Ultimately, it's difficult to say what it will go on to. Starry Sky AF is a feature that was built around the new Trupic 9 processor. Um, so ultimately, it can't go on any camera that has a lower processor because it doesn't have the processing capabilities to do that. Um, technically, the one model that does have the capabilities to do that would be the EM1X because it has two Trupic 8 processors. So it technically has more processing power in two older processors. Um, they haven't said ultimately officially whether or not it will go over to that. If they do, it would be via a firmware update. But at this stage, we just don't know. We hope to see it moved into newer models as they're built, obviously. Um, but yeah, there's no way that Starry Sky can go on to lower processor models so it couldn't go on to an em5 and it couldn't go on to an em10 but it could potentially go on to an em1x if they chose to but they haven't said officially if they will or not thanks david no problem okay so uh just give you an idea <laughs> that young man there getting sprayed 
with sand is one of our uh, photographers, Fernando. Fernando is a phenomenal action photographer who I had the pleasure to work with at last year's in-person uh, photography show in Birmingham. Um, and he's got an EM1X with an eight millimeter fisheye lens on there. And the camera that's just popped up in the corner is displaying the image that he achieved by doing that. Um, absolutely fantastic. Uh, uh, one of our ambassadors, Chris Aya Walker, took the image of Fernando Marmaleo uh, taking that shot. And I watched uh, a video of Fernando pouring <laughs> pouring a bottle of water over his EM1X and lens to wash the sand off afterwards. Uh, and even though I know the system's very capable of handling that, I, even I flinched a little bit. Uh, but as a young man without a care in the world, he didn't, uh, he didn't flinch at all. So the EM1X, this is the big daddy. Uh, of the OMD series. It is the largest footprint. It has the built-in grip, uh, but it also has several things that the other models don't have. Uh, and this is something that we'll look at just now. A new reliability benchmark. Ergonomics have been improved ultimately for this one, and they are designed to incorporate uh, the much larger lenses. When the EM1X was designed, the R&D experts had already built a mock-up of the, of the soon-to-be-released 150 to 400 millimeter lens, so they were designing it with the bigger lenses in mind. Optimal handling that is uh, uh, accessible both through portrait and landscape operations as well. So obviously you can see there, this uh, camera down at the bottom is overshadowing uh, an SLR uh, equivalent of a 600 millimeter lens and body. So the, the size difference is, is huge. Individual buttons for specific jobs, ISO buttons, exposure compensation buttons, and of course, dual joysticks. And a high magnif magnification, high speed viewfinder with a massively clear display rate. So you get 100% field of view with an, a 0.83 times magnifications and up to 120 frames per second refresh rate, which, uh, go, which basically shows a very smooth uh, view and a lag time of 0 0.005 seconds, which is virtually undetectable by the human eye. It was the first camera to have the IPX1 weather resistance rating. So the first camera, not just for Olympus, but ever in the industry. And IPX1 uh, weather resistance rating stands for ingress protection. Uh, with, of course, our leading dust reduction and heat management systems. The dust reduction system is the supersonic wave filter that you can see in the middle image there. And the heat management system comes from a chimney stack dissipation uh, process on the back of the camera. No overheating from this one. There are some manufacturers that can't claim that, I'm sure. Of course, we have a dual battery built in with USB power delivery. Again, this is USB PD, so you can either charge it when the camera's off or you can operate it with a USB power delivery power bank. And the charging time for both batteries in total will be two hours. There's that shutter unit with the 400,000 actuation lifetime and a user interface that was designed with professionals in mind, which now adds a customizable menu, the My Menu process, which indeed is also available on the EM1 Mark III now as well. So the autofocus system was massively redeveloped for the EM1X because it was built with wildlife and sport professionals in mind. Again, this is one of Fernando Marmaleo's images. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Such a great action photographer. Uh, so you have this, the EM1, uh, the, the flagship 121, all cross type phase detection sensor, but now without any light flux limitations, which means that the low light capabilities have been massively enhanced on this model. A new algorithm with constant information recording so that as it's continually autofocusing, it's learning all the time and tracking the subject as it goes. And a multi-selector. The Japanese wanted us to call this the multi-selector knob. I did explain to them that this might not translate very well in English. Uh, so, but they insisted that I put multi-selector knob into the presentation. However, for the rest of us, we're going to call it a joystick for the rest of the evening because we all know what it is. But the Japanese just seem to love multi-selector knobs. 
fully adjustable AF with the target modes that you can create. So you have that single five, nine, 25, and all 121 point group for cluster tracking, but you can also create your own user generated AF areas depending on the subject. And this is such a useful tool when you're shooting specific subjects that might be a certain shape or size. And the big thing that none of the other cameras have, and ultimately if you own an EM1X, and yes, I'm looking at you guys over there, Mary and Robert, fantastic stuff. Wake yourself up at 6 a.m. in the morning, ready to download the new firmware of bird detection that is being added in. So what have we got on there already? We've got Motorsports uh, Automatic Detection. This is designed with deep learning AI algorithms in mind. It's one of the first of its nature. Uh, the motorsports algorithm can detect any vehicle with four or two wheels. It will also detect a driver with a helmet if it can be seen. You've also got the aircraft detection, which strangely enough works very well on some birds already. Uh, and then the train detection as well. And tomorrow morning with the firmware update, the EM1X will be updated to include bird detection as well. Finally, long awaited. And we've been feeding the AI deep learning algorithm, billions of images of birds for the last year to try and develop that for you guys. Uh, and of course you can see here what happens when the, uh, the target is tracked. Uh, a white box will indicate that the camera has seen what it's meant to, what it's been asked to see. So it's been, it's seen a motorsports or a vehicle with two or four wheels. Uh, and then when the button, uh, the shutter button is half pushed, it will lock onto that vehicle and then further lock onto a driver's head if it can be seen. The minus six EV low light limit. So this sensor is now benefiting from that, uh, from no light flux limitations to manage down to minus six EV. And I've tried my camera in absolute darkness and it does uh, focus exceptionally well. Tomorrow evening, I'm actually filming, uh, a, not tomorrow evening, Friday evening, I'll be filming a light painting video for the Olympus UK Facebook channel uh, to be released in the middle of December. And I'm gonna be shooting a cottage that will be in complete darkness when I start shooting. And I'm very confident that the camera will focus uh, on that cottage before I go. So let's look at the high speed performance now, obviously 18 frames per second it, when tracking in raw uh, up to 74 continuous shots before the buffer slows, not stops, but slows. Um, you've also got up to 60 frames per second sequential shooting in raw up to 49 shots before the buffer slows. OK. Uh, and pro capture mode that shoots without blackout. Okay, so that means that effectively when you're shooting in sequential burst, you don't get a blackout view once you start firing proper. So anti-flicker mode also in there for sports halls, so indoor sports halls and mechanical shutter shooting. This is to stop any um, unnecessary or uneven exposure between frames when shooting bursts in those sport halls. And the twin slots are both UHS-2 compatible. So both of these memory card slots will take the UHS-2 high speed memory cards. And the memory cards that I use in my UHS-2 slot are 300 megabytes per second write speed. So really nice and fast for super quick buffering. And one of the big things that you can do with both the EM1X and the EM1 Mark III is whilst the camera is buffering, you are not stopped from, you're not prevented from doing anything. You continue to change menu settings. You can carry on shooting. You can even start playing back the images that have already written to the card before the card's written the whole sequence. So there is nothing to stop you uh, whilst buffering. And that's because of the twin processor architecture that's built into the camera. So this is a dual TruePK engine. So two chips on a 20 megapixel live MOS sensor, seven and a half stops of compensation in the five axis stabilization system with that gyroscope sensor, which is five times more accurate than anything we've ever produced. 50 million pixel handheld high resolution mode. That image from that percentage of the, uh, of the first and uh, foremost image. Built-in live neutral density with a preview of exactly how your image is going to come out. This is one of the weirdest things in the world is to see live ND in action, whereby if you're shooting water at waterfalls, you will see through the viewfinder or on the back screen how that sort of smoky water will look before you've even shot. 
Video options, very similar to the EM1 Mark III, handheld cinema quality, so up to cinema 4K quality, fully weatherproof, uh, and obviously that five-axis stabilization as well. Adjustments capable uh, uh, are applicable to the continual autofocus, the stabilizer, and the uh, level of stabilization that can be applied, because sometimes you don't want a powerful stabilizer in video, particularly if you're panning. Access to OM log for post-edit grading. And a fully expandable system. We always like to show you pictures of our cameras sitting in water. Okay, but uh, if you've got one, don't, don't leave it sitting in a river. It'll either wash away or a bear will try and eat it. It's not wise. Uh, you do get obviously free of charge Olympus workspace software. Now the Olympus workspace software is also where you'll be doing your firmware upgrades as well. So if any of you are using an old Olympus firmware update, data software, get rid of it, delete it. It should be all gone now and everything runs through Olympus workspace. You've also got the free Olympus capture software, which is for, uh, not only for cable tethering, but only, for, but also for Wi-Fi tethering on the EM1X and EM1 Mark III as well. I love cable free tethering. It's probably one of the most uh, refreshing experiences I've ever had to just connect up to my, uh, my MacBook uh, wirelessly with the camera and shoot studio. Although my models tend to be small with wings, not quite the same as that model on that stool. And there is a built in field sensor system. So very much like the tough cameras, you have a barometer, a compass, a live compass, a GPS system to give you a longitude and latitude, uh, a heat uh, a sensor, a temperature sensor. You can also find out exactly how far above or below sea level you are and find out what the air pressure is like. And all of these things can be recorded into a GPS log as well. Okay, <clears throat> before we break for, uh, for a little tea break, Let's have a look at the uh, Olympus fun facts. So the supersonic wave filter that vibrates the sensor 30,000 times per second every time you switch the camera on and off uh, to get rid of dust. Uh, how much G-force is applied by that? Well, let's have a look at what Gs do. So 1G is a human while standing or sitting. We're just having 1G applied to us on the planet. 3Gs is the space shuttle during the ascent. 5Gs is the dips and turns of a roller coaster, and 6Gs is that's the Formula One car. 10Gs of a Red Bull air race stunt plane. So if that's how many Gs are in those things, how many Gs are exerted by the supersonic wave filter? Well, several thousands of Gs are exerted in a very small area on that supersonic wave filter because dust is so light, it needs such a force to throw it off. The gyro sensor was developed for a rocket. We can't tell you which one, so we've just written the word energy on that rocket. <laughs> you have to try and work out which rocket it was designed for, but we're not allowed to tell you. Uh, but the preciseness is the same level as the sensor that was developed for that rocket. Now, we talk about lens surface control. This is about production of our lenses. And again, this is why the new, newest big lenses are going to take so long to manufacture. The preciseness of our lens production means that on the lens surface, it's controlled at nanometer levels, okay? Which ultimately means that if a 40 to 150 lens, which is approximately three inches across, if that was three kilometers wide in real life, then the unevenness could be measured with the diameter of a human hair if it was three kilometers wide. So imagine what that unevenness is with it being three inches wide. It's, it's absolutely nanoscopic. And again, with that in mind, the precisionness of the image sensor shift for high res shots, if you imagine that the sensor is the size of a rugby pitch, the movement is controlled to the thinness of a blade of grass across that size. Thank you very much for listening to me go on about how great these cameras are and how good the innovative technologies are. I am very proud to work for Olympus because we create some fantastic things. My uh, contact details are on the screen now. Please do take uh, note of them if you do want to contact me in the future. I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, just now. And then I think that leads us quite nicely into a tea break. David, can I ask a question? Of course, yes. More than happy to take uh, questions. I'm thinking of buying the M13 Mark III. Um, would the Olympus workspace be available for that as well? 
Absolutely. Olympus Workspace software is compatible with all Olympus cameras. So it is this it is the software that you can use to edit your files with. It is the software that you can use to create stacks outside of camera if you're doing focus stacking and also the software that will enable you to uh, update your firmware. Also, very nicely, one of the tools within Olympus Workspace is the ability to save the settings that you have your camera set to and keep a copy of them on your computer. Should you ever need to reset the camera, you can then reapply those settings at a later date. Yeah. Does, it, does it automatically come with the uh, camera when you buy the camera? It doesn't, no. We live in a world now where all software is a digital download. So you would have to go to olympus.co.uk uh, and then just click the download section, but it's all completely free. Uh, if you get to a point where anybody's asking you for money for the Olympus software, don't click it. It's def definitely not us. I, I already have uh, Olympus software for my EM10. Uh, I presume it would just either sit alongside that or um, would it overwrite it or what? So my biggest advice is any software that you have on your computer now for previous uh, generations to get rid of and then have a completely fresh install of the latest workspace software from us. And that just avoids any conflicts in the system because that can sometimes throw a few spanners in the work. So we do recommend that you get rid of the old stuff and then do a fresh install of the newer stuff. So the EM10 would work with workspace as well, the old EM10 Mark II? Absolutely, yeah. All of the previous generations will work with the latest software. Brilliant, thanks David. No problem at all. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions before we go to a break? Um, uh, the review seemed to think that the Mark III was a lot better than the Mark II, um, but what do you think is the downsides of the Mark III? That is a great question, Lucy. What is the downside of the Mark III? I mean, ultimately, I haven't found a downside. To oh, no, no, there is a downside. I tell a lie. The only one that I can think of is that they moved the blooming menu button from one place in the camera to another. And for the first month of using it, my thumb would go to the place where it should have been. And it was actually on the on the other hand. So that was a little bit of a downside in the sense that my muscle memory has got a bit twisted after that. Uh, but I have now started to remember that the buttons have moved. In terms of other negative sides, I can't really think of one from an EM1 Mark II to a Mark III. The, the jump is quite substantial in lots of small areas. So it actually was a really, really good um, uh, improvement and upgrade. Uh, it's difficult to think of any other negatives other than that blinking menu button moving. <laughs> right, it's, uh, it's 8.30. Shall we have 10 minute break and then start again at 8.40? Sounds okay, great to me. Okay, right. I'm going to pause the recording, but you'll still be open to chat as you want. Uh, just to say, I can definitely sympathise with Lucy. I had an eight-year-old had a birthday two weeks ago in the middle of a lockdown. And the most difficult thing to do with an eight-year-old is have a birthday in a lockdown. And there was wrapping paper in every room of this house. And then not 24 hours later, there was bits of Lego stuck on both of my feet. So... Yes, I can definitely emphasize that. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so just to quickly catch up, uh, during the break, Joyce put a question in for me in the chat, um, just marking that I said that I preferred the EM1 Mark III over the X for macro, and which did I think would be better for landscape and low light, uh, taking into consideration that Joyce doesn't do wildlife or sport. And I would definitely say the EM1 Mark III, uh, because it is more portable. If you're going to do landscapes, then potentially you could be hiking around with this camera kit. So a 1 Mark III is definitely lighter. All of the cameras now, with the exception of the EM10, have the fully articulated screens which flip out to the side and, and all sorts of things. And of course, if you're into your selfies, you can turn them around and take a good old picture of yourself as well. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, Joyce, I would definitely recommend an EM1 Mark III. Potentially, realistically as well, I may even actually say an EM5 Mark III as well. You may not even need to go to an EM1 series. For landscape and low light photography, the 5 Mark III is more than capable. Don't spend more than you have to, particularly in this day and age. Thank don't tell much. that's great this particular recording of me saying don't spend as much money on olympus needs to not go anywhere else thank you very much <laughs> very good uh, okay so uh 
not sure if anybody uh, developed any questions throughout the break after the presentation in the first half. If you did, I can see everybody now. Just give me a wave and I can and, and I can sort of shout you out and we can put some questions yeah, forward. Ah, Robert and Mary have got questions, but hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Wait, no, no, they haven't got questions. Oh, just giving us a wave. <laughs> Ken's got a question. Yeah, I've got the OM, OM2, uh, Mark 2. Uh, can I update that as well on, on, on that workspace thing? You can, Ken, yeah. Is it the 1 Mark 2 or the 5 Mark 2? No idea. <laughs> it's the one mark two. E E M one mark two. All right. Well, with your OMD E M one mark two, you can of course go through workspace and click update camera, and that will bring you up to the latest firmware on that one. And I highly recommend doing it as well because the E M one mark two is currently up to version three point four. So there's lots of cool features that have been added into it. All right. I've not done it since I bought it last year. So <laughs> we'll definitely do an update. Yes, do an update. Do a full get a full battery in there and don't do it on a on a dodgy internet connection, but otherwise do an update. Okay. Uh, Jeff's got a question. Yeah. Um, are you going to be dealing with flash or not? I'm going to do a little bit with flash today. Uh, did you want to know what flash is available or no, how to no, use I've it? I've got a problem with the flash system. Oh, okay. Um, Put the flash on the camera, it works brilliantly. I've got um, a commander and uh, a receiver, and when that's used, the flash overexposes. And once I put the, the flash gun on the receiver, I cannot control any of the buttons on it at all. Who makes, your, who makes the receiver? Is it Olympus? The Olympus receiver and commander, and the Olympus flash. Oh, interesting. So there's an FCWR, FC... Uh, WC. Yeah. FC, WR, uh, FR, WR. A little bit yeah, like, uh, let's get that in yeah. there. There we go. Let Not me just get that into focus for you. Yeah. That one there. yeah. Okay. So let me get some focus back in here. Um, so ultimately, that's a very complex thing to talk about right now, Jeff. But well, we do do. It, 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 can it be? I mean, it, does it happen all the time? Or, no, know, no, no, it doesn't, doesn't happen all the time. So there's, there's probably a very easy fix, but it's something that me and you need to talk about separately and privately uh, without everyone else listening in and going, well, it's not my problem. Okay. Um, so ultimately, at Olympus, we do do virtual one-to-ones. Uh, and if you email me at david.smith at olympus.co.uk, I will make an arrangement to have a private video call with you with the kit there, and we'll fix that for you. Brilliant. Just one other quick question. Of um, course, yeah. We used to have a, used to have leads because I used to use OM two ends with dual flashes T thirty twos to doing owls at night, um, and you had you had yeah. the leads. Now you don't do those leads anymore. Um, is it advisable to use the independent leads that flash to the camera or not? If your flash has a PC sync input on it, then yes, you can because the camera has a PC sync output socket anyway. So you can use the leads if you want to. How, oh, however, oh, I, I don't really recommend it with the newer flash. I think okay. it's, you're better off using the fully wireless systems because that's what they were designed to be used with. Fair enough. I'll, I'll get back to you later. <laughs> Send me an email. I will spend an, uh, as long as it takes with you in a, in a, in a call to get I'll that sorted. I'll get a piece of paper and write the details. <laughs> okay, no problem, Jeff. Uh, anyone else before I crack on with the demonstration? Lucy's got a, got a question. And then Linda and Pete. Um, for people that want to move systems from a different brand, kind of, what do you think about the converters for other lenses for people that might kind of move to a, an Olympus body but still have a Canon lens or a different type of lens? So there are a lot of people that still use their Canon lenses with the Olympus system. The one thing you have to bear in mind is that if you're moving to the Olympus system for the size and weight issue, transferring those lenses is not going to be a good idea for you because you're still carrying a full frame or a crop factor DSLR lens weight. If that's not a problem for you and you just want to keep a little bit of those lenses going in terms of being efficient and economical on price and money, which a lot of people do want to do, then you will experience a slight degrade in the AF speed depending on what adapters you get. So if you get, you can get some very good ones. Metabones are a very popular uh, adapter system. You do the Metabone speed boosters that go from Canon to Olympus or Sony to Olympus or Nikon to Olympus, and they work very, very well. You get some cheaper ones, they're not going to be as efficient on the system. 
So ultimately what I would say is, yeah, absolutely go for it. It will work. But if you want to change because of weight, if it's a back problem or a neck problem, then that's not going to help you at all. Okay. Uh, there and Pete, I think it was Pete gave me a wave. Yeah, it is. It's regarding the new lens, the 400 millimeter lens. Which one? one? The one that's, the the one that's, that's just been released, the, uh, the 400 mil. Yeah. Uh, I believe it only goes on to the X, MX. It doesn't do the three or two or all that. Will it goes on all of them. Three? No, it goes on all of them, Pete. All micro four thirds lenses go on all micro four thirds bodies. The only oh. difference will be moving between Panasonic oh. and Olympus and which features are compatible. But ultimately, oh. normal photography, yeah, absolutely. So any lens that we make at Olympus will go on any micro four thirds Olympus bodies. Okay, thank you. No problem at all. I and love David, busting. David. Yes, George. Can you please accept my apologies? Because I'll be leaving about nine o'clock. I'm gutted and heartbroken, George, but I'll see you on the next one. Okay, mate. No problem Thank at you. all. Thank you. Good night, right. Bye. Good night. Bye, George. Take care. Bye, George. Um, Let's have a little look at a demonstration, I think. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and make sure that all my technology works. I'm going to transfer over to a camera. I'm going to show you some of the macro capabilities initially. Um, and then I want to show you the focus stacking features as well. Now, when I do shift to focus stacking features, because of the nature of the technology that I use to show you this on screen, the cable connection doesn't allow me to directly show you focus stacking on the camera that I'm using. So what I'll do when I move to that is that I'll be using another camera, a second camera to film the back of the first one. There's a bit of an inception thing goes on, I'm camera on camera on camera, but it works and you should hopefully see what's going on. And then when it comes down to showing you the final image, I will switch the cables back so you can see a nice clean image of that. Then what I'll do is I'll show you the STF-8 macro flash and some of the benefits of having that flash. Uh, and out of probably three or four benefits of having them, one benefit is probably the biggest and that is background isolation when using a macro flash. So we'll have a little look at that as well. Uh, now this is the longest demonstration in the world. So, uh, so you'll have an opportunity to ask me some more questions at the end. Uh, so I'm just gonna try and now transfer over. If my technology works, I'm gonna go to camera one. Here we go. Uh, and I'm actually gonna make my screen a little bit bigger so that I can see uh, what I'm doing. Let me just move this around. You won't see any of this business in your recording because it's all on my side. Okay. <laughs> so what you're seeing there is the live view screen uh, of an EM1 Mark II. And I'm actually going to be recording the back of this EM1 Mark II in a little while on an EM1 Mark III. Okay. I'm just going to press some info buttons to shift around the information that you see on screen. Now I've got uh, this EM1 Mark II paired up with a 60 millimeter macro. OK, now the 60 millimeter macro has the capability of shooting at one to one ratio, which is considered true macro, a minimum of one to one ratio to shoot true macro uh, or greater. So one to one or two to one or, three or five to one, etc. But at least one to one for true macro. Now, the macro macro purists out there will say you absolutely have to do this to shoot macro. Otherwise, you're just shooting close up photography. Uh, now, I don't particularly care. So if you're shooting close up, but it's not one to one, let's call it macro for argument's sake. So Sorry, first things. So we'll be in screen sharing because I'm not at the minute. No, sorry. Are you you should just be seeing what uh, the, what my camera sees at the moment. No, we're seeing everybody on the screen. Yeah, you've not you've not shared your screen with everybody, so um, you're pretty small on Zoom. I so, can see it, actually, I've got I can see the. Yeah, what you guys need to do is while you're in that gallery view and you see that tiny screen of mine, if you hover your mouse over my screen, there's three little buttons, uh, and you can pin my screen, uh, and then you can go full screen as well. So if you pin my screen. And then in the top corner, it says view. You can click speak of you and my view will be your entire screen. That should work for you. Thank you. Otherwise, yeah. setting it to speak of you works as well because David's doing the, the best way to get it big. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it a couple of ways uh, on Zoom. But yeah, speak of you will make me big because I'm talking right now. Um, OK, good. Hopefully everyone's happy with that. 
Uh, okay, so uh, in the 60 millimeter macro, when shooting one to one, uh, you definitely need to be manual focused. Now, I'm not going to shoot one to one uh, right now because I've got a subject in front of there. There is a flower. We'll see it come into focus in a second. Uh, but what I want to do first is show you that I've got a couple of different helpful uh, tools in the camera to enable me to shoot macro. Now, in manual focus, uh, I'm going to start turning this ring now until my subject comes into focus. And here it comes. And I'm looking on top of my macro lens and I'm heading up there. And this is a approximately when I get to where I want to be about there that's at one to one to three ratio so not one to one but one to three uh, now if I wanted to go to one to one I can go all the way up to one to one on my manual focus there's a gauge on top of the lens that tells me I'm in manual I mean one to one and then I would need to move my subject closer to achieve one to one there we go that's the subject coming in at one to one but I don't want to do that Want a little bit, be a little bit outside of one to one, so you see more of that flower. There we go, just like that. Now this is great because I've got a nice big full screen. I can kind of see what I'm doing. But normally, if I'm scrabbling around underneath the bushes and things, trying to take pictures of fungus and mushrooms and all sorts of creepy crawlies, I can't really see much of what's going on. So I'm actually going to feed in my studio light now, the light that makes me look absolutely amazing on camera, and I'm going to use that, the light this flower turn it away from me so i need a little bit of an assistant okay so all olympus cameras have a focus peaking feature in there which basically means when i'm using manual focus there will be a flash of color along the focal plane that is in focus uh, and all i'm going to do to enable that is i'm going to go to the menus and head on down into my custom menu and autofocus modes and in my fourth autofocus mode there's a manual focus assistant tool uh, and I just need to switch that peaking on in there now any of you that have got an Olympus camera if you want one-to-ones we do give free one-to-ones there is currently a two to three week wait for them because it is only me delivering them for the UK but we can go over this in detail with you if you're an Olympus user if you're not an Olympus user now but think you may be in the future and when you buy one you want to have a session to bring you up to speed with using your new camera the same thing applies have a virtual one-to-one -one with us so focus peaking is now on. What that means now is that when I twist the dial, the, the focus dial, I should be looking at seeing a flash of color across here. Now, sadly, I'm not seeing any color at the moment because it's not in the right color. Now, if I press the info button, I can actually change the color of this peaking action that's going on. So believe it or not, black is actually a good uh, one to see in this one because black works very well uh, against yellow. Now, it's difficult for you to see. Zoom pulls a lot of this out. You might just about see it here. Let me see if changing the color helps. Zoom is not great for showing uh, this particular feature off, but there we go. You'll just see a cut, a little glimmer uh, of light there. I'm gonna try enhance that ever so slightly. Yeah. Um, and that focus peaking, which I can see on the back of my camera, but sadly Zoom is pulling out because Zoom does that to, to photographic features. Uh, this is what will show me what's in focus as I'm focusing through. Oh, there we go. Get a there we go. You can see a little bit in the feathers in the feathered petals back there, and I can bring that forward to this section as well and see a little bit closer up. That's my focus peaking assistant, and it tells me where I am in the image. So I want to get that to where I want to be, which will be about there. Uh, and then I'm going to shoot really slow on here. I've got a small LED light that's lighting this up and I'm, shooting, I'm going to shoot really slow for a, for a purpose later on. I want to get a nice clean image of this ISO 200. I'm going to shoot at a third of a second. Uh, and that's to show you some, uh, some stacking action later on. But let me just take this image here. This is my 60 mil macro in manual focus with focus peaking. Have a little playback of that. Uh, and there we go. Nice sharp edges on that flower there, which is absolutely uh, phenomenal in terms of detail. Now, one of the biggest problems we have is that macro gives us a very shallow depth of field. Okay, that's quite natural. The closer you get, the more you magnify, uh, the shallower that depth of field becomes. But the OMD range, the EM5 and the EM1 series, has focus stacking built in. And focus stacking is gonna take several images uh, at different focal points, so here, 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 and here, all the way through up to 15 on an EM1, 
and it will stack them together automatically in camera to create a final JPEG image. Or it will let you bracket up to 999 shots and stack them yourself in, in post-edit software. So what I want to do now is I'm actually going to cross over my camera to the filming camera that I've got. So the, the screen's going to go blank for just a second, but I'm still here, so don't worry. So I'm just going to switch that over and the cable's going to go into my filming camera just there. And there we go. Let's get rid of this information here. And let me get a reasonable view of the back of the screen. Now, the reason why I've done that is because I can't actually focus stack with that cable attached to that camera, okay? Uh, but what you'll see now is that the word, the letter BKT has now popped up on my camera. Now, this means that bracketing is active and I'm gonna focus stack this image. Now, if you're focus stacking in camera, you're producing a final image in camera, a final JPEG from between three and 15 shots that the camera takes automatically. Now, uh, in order to do that, it has to compress it slightly. So you get a 7% crop. So you'll see that there's a kind of a gray uh, outline grid there. That's telling you that your final stacked image is only everything inside that outline grid. So uh, what we want to do first is we need to find an initial starting point. Now we're seeing much more of that focus peaking now. That's quite nice to see now that we've switched cameras over. There we go. Zoom such a pain in the backside for things like that. Um, so with focus stacking, I need to find a focal point, a starting focal point that is about 40 to 50% into the image. So I'm going to start about there. And if I start there, the camera should jump nearer towards me ever so slightly. Uh, to take those images and then move further away. And this is the reason why I'm using such a slow shutter speed is so that you can watch this happening. In real life, the whole process is relevant to the shutter speed. So if I was shooting at, at 500th of a second, the whole thing would be over and done with in an instant. But I've slowed this down so that you can see it to a third of a second. And I also shoot at f5.6 on this macro lens because that's the sharpest point on the 60 millimeter macro. Okay, so I found my sort of 40% into the image for focus stacking. I'm now gonna let the camera take the shots. And we can see it jumping through those different focal points. It's taking 15 images, I've set it to the maximum. Then it's gonna be busy and it's gonna create a final shot. Now at this stage, I am going to remove the cable from the filming camera and go back to the active camera to show you that final image nice and cleanly, okay? So I'm gonna press the playback now. And that is a final stacked image. Now, if you remember the first image I took, only a thin slither of the center point of that, uh, that gerbera was in focus. And now with this 15 stacked image, we've got clarity from here, all the way at the bottom, that central part of the daisy, all the way through that top end just there. And that's the purpose of focus stacking is to achieve that extra depth of field um, and get that, uh, that, that, that subject more in focus, even when we're challenged with shooting at macro. Now, one of the main reasons you would do that is because, yes, of course, you could stop down the f-stop to get a wider depth of field. But two things are happening. One, we're losing light straight away. Look at that. If I shoot at that now, it's going to be two stops under. How dark is that? very dark. Now I can't change the light in here. This is all the light I've got. So stopping down to F11 is not an option. Uh, I'm also going to get uh, diffraction. I'm going to get softness as I go through the F range, as you do with any lens. So we want to keep it at the best possible F-stop, both, both light and quality. And by stacking those 15 shots, that's how we acquire the best quality image through that. Now, whilst we're, uh, we're there, we're also now going to look at uh, using that function with a flash. But before I move on to the flash, because I do actually have to make some adjustments now uh, with the scene, I'm more than happy, I can kind of see people in the gallery there, uh, more than happy if anyone's got any questions regarding the macro slash focus stacking setup there, uh, feel free now to just sort of chip in, chirp up and ask me while I make some adjustments. I want to know where the ladybird is, David. <laughs> Poor ladybird. I, I put it back in the garden. We've got to tell the story, though, Robert, on the ladybird. We can't just say, where's the ladybird? So ultimately, this, the story is, 
Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate enough to be able to give my own workshops. And I think Robert and Mary attended one of my, my own personal workshops one day where I was showing off um, some of the functionality. And despite the fact that it is December, on that exact day, I found a ladybird in my conservatory, very much alive, a little bit sleepy. Um, so the ladybird became a subject and we very gently coaxed it onto a white daisy and used that for the, for the focus stacking demonstration. And it fell asleep in the daisy for the whole duration. And afterwards, I was in debate as to whether or not to put it back in the conservatory where it was nice and warm or let it out where it may inevitably die quite instantly outside. Um, but I did let it out and I put it on the, um, with a rose bush just by the back door and I put it on the rose bush. <laughs> and let it go back to nature robert that's what i did with with that one it's not often that we get live subjects in um in december so i was very thankful for it <laughs> okay so the next subject matter uh is one of my favorite things in this season as well and we're not going to be shooting anywhere near one-to-one -one with this one so i'm going to pull this right back this is a, a twig with lichen and lichen is a fantastic um subject matter in the winter because lichen is a is everywhere it's moss and lichen and they're fab fabulous colors and different kind of architectural structures that they create very alien world like so great for um for macro now i'm going to switch the flash on i've got an stf8 macro flash probably the best macro flash i've ever used and and i did come from a canon background as well now, with the STF-8 macro flash, uh, you can use it on its own, of course, with TTL or full manual, or you can use it with focus stacking and bracketing, but in manual only. Now, I'm just going to take a single shot here to show you one of the biggest reasons why having a macro flash will change the way that you shoot your photography, because there are two ways to see an image, okay? So actually, let me turn it off. Let me take a picture of this, a very normal picture of this. Uh, speed it up a little bit because the light's changed a single shot at f5.6 of this lichen with just the natural light that we have which in this case happens to be an led uh but this could have been taken outside and i want you to take note of the foreground and the background okay so this is the lichen fabulous incredible stuff a bit of a lichen geek but this is you know there, there really are very interesting structures that you can take and if you're running out of subject matter in the winter these are perfect this is a single shot obviously that gives us that very shallow macro depth of field and a gray background because the wall behind it is well it's actually magnolia but it, it looks gray the image so this is our natural light shot now then i'm going to switch my stf8 macro flash on it's in manual power at the moment because I'm going to need to use manual power when I show you the focus stacking on here. But this is just to give you an example of what's going on. I can now switch my shutter speed up to the maximum sync of 250th of a second. And I'm going to take a single shot. This is the difference that we've now achieved. This is the background isolation that the flash can produce for you. So we've gone from natural light with a light background so the flash being used for a dark background. So between the two, we're creating two very different images. And the quality increases exponentially. The minute you introduce high quality flashlights, you're getting even sharper images with the benefit of that super dark background. And this is why I love flash, because you can create these two styles of images and then choose what you want to do with them. Now, I'm just going to detach the cable again. It's going to go a bit dark and I'm going to go over to my filming camera. Go. And we're now going to film the flash in use uh, with stacking on this. Now, again, I need to find 40% in. Oh, getting good focus peaking on this particular subject. That's quite nice. Nice to be able to see where we're going. I'm going to go about there. That's my starting point, about 40% in. Now, what you'll notice is that because I've switched the flash on, I can no longer use 250th of a second. And this is one of the things that you need to bear in mind when using flash with electronic shutter features such as stacking is that you are limited to a maximum of 50th of a second. You're not hand holding a focus stack with flash is basically what I'm trying to say. Uh, so you need to bear that in mind. 
Uh, now, we know that the flash power is good because we've just taken a shot. This will now take uh, 15 images. That little white box that just popped up there, if anybody saw it, by the way, was the face detect. So unless there's a ghost on my lichen that I can't see, the camera seems to think there's a face in the lichen. Let's ignore that. <laughs> So I'm going to let the camera take the shot now and we will see it will fire the flash at every opportunity for each shot. Here we go. It's flash, 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 flash all the way through. We can see it stepping through the image, uh, maintaining that nice dark background for us. It takes the 15 shots and it processes them all together. Now I'm going to take the cable out. We're going to go back over to the active camera to see that clean image just there. That's the playback and here we go this is our focus stat image of lichen now if i bring this back to the start let's have a little zoom in this is the lichen this is where we managed to get focus from in terms of distance to us and it's gone towards infinity all the way back through this fantastic structure on the twig and it's ended here now the only reason i would want to then go from stacking in camera to bracketing where i would edit them in software on my laptop afterwards is if that point on the twig wasn't far enough for me and i needed to take more than 15 shots but otherwise that is a very usable image uh, if i do say so myself and that is the benefit of using flash with macro and also the bonus that is focus stacking in camera for the olympus system uh, I'm going to leave that image up there and come back to the gallery view. And, uh, and, and, and this is the point where I say thank you very much for listening to everything that I've had to say. Thank you very much for watching the demonstration. And please do uh, throw as many questions at me as you have. And if you are just in stunned silence, I'll also take that. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, David. That was fabulous. Thank you. Yes, brilliant. Thanks. Brilliant. Oh, you're very welcome. Hopefully it's been insightful and entertaining at the same time. I do try and maintain that entertainment is a massive part of what we do. Uh, there's no good showing you these things if they're boring. Now, of course, obviously, for those of you that aren't with Olympus and don't already know, we do have, we provide a huge amount of aftercare since March, just to give you a few figures, really, and something that I'm very proud of, uh, be, for, uh, in terms of working for the company and I know that Mary and Robert are already aware of this because they've very much been a massive part of my own lockdown life in the last year mm. um, but since March the 27th which was the day that we got locked down uh, uh, into home working from home I have delivered 647 virtual video one-to-one -one sessions with customers or potential customers that wanted to switch onto the system I've also delivered 89 virtual workshops with at least 25 attendees for each one showing and explaining and educating on the olympus features specifically we've also put out facebook content of which i've personally delivered 26 facebook live events where we've also used that uh, that channel to teach our customers and potential customers about the benefits of the system and also how to improve your photography in general even if you're not an Olympus user and at no stage did we charge for any of that so for me it's been a proud year in terms of doing everything that we've done for our customers to continue to do things like that with the camera clubs as we have done physically in the past has been an absolute pleasure so I hope for those of you that currently use Olympus you make the most out of our free services for those of you that don't that might be thinking about it I hope that you would have um you would feel confident and safe in terms of knowing that you'd get the the best aftercare particularly in the uk that's available within the industry so thank you very much everybody for listening i'm going to put my camera back on now so that you can see my face so although a little bit red and warm because the heating in the studio has kicked in now and i need to switch down some of the lighting in here um but thanks very much for listening everybody yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Could we have your contact details? Absolutely. So my contact details are david.smith at olympus.co.uk. What I'll do, David, is I'll email everybody out so they've got a, a, a... Absolutely, yeah. Anybody that needs that. And of course, if you're not keen, then you can email the boss at <laughs> nikon.co.uk. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Nikon. <laughs>
<laughs> there is nothing wrong with Nikon. Some of my best friends. In fact, it's quite interesting that this year um, I'm lucky enough to have some amazing friends that are also peers uh, working for other manufacturers, uh, Nikon, Panasonic, Sony in particular, and Fuji, actually. I have two very good friends working for Fuji. Um, and all of them have been amazing uh, support in terms of we support each other in the industry because we've all been locked down. We've all been working from home. Some of them were furloughed. Some of them weren't. I was lucky to, to not be furloughed. Um, but everybody that works within their respective brands are amazing in this country. We have some really phenomenal reps. So if you are uh, with another brand, make the most of your local rep because they are there to help you. David, can you just show us the STF-8? Can you just hold it up, what it looks like? Let me detach it all from its system. And also, before I go as well, I'll, show, I'll quickly show you some example images as well, just so you can get an idea in real life of what they can do. So this is the EM1 Mark II with the 60 millimeter macro on it and the STF-8, which obviously does have the adjustable heads, the diffusers oh, oh. Uh, and the adjustable angle heads as well. And a very, very simple controller on the back just there, which allows you to control uh, TTL power and adjustment of power per head. So you can adjust uh, full to half or half to quarter or et cetera, et cetera, through those heads as well. Um, and if I bring up very quickly my pre-prepared folder uh, in terms of images, I would like to first show you um, an image of an in-camera stack. This is going to be a JPEG. So, um, if I can share my screen here, this is a JPEG output of a hoverfly. I think that should be sharing now. Wow. Mm. Uh, this is on the 60 mil macro. Uh, this is on an EM1 Mark II as well, because it, it was it was quite some time ago. Um, and you can see exactly how much detail is available through a JPEG version of an in-camera stack. Mm. But you can see very, very clearly that that in-camera stack has a definite stop once you run out of images. And that, that would be when you would then want to set, step into bracketing mode. Now, I generally step into macro bracketing uh, when I put extension tubes on and I want to really kind of get close up to something. Uh, and a good example of that one, where I have two nice examples of that one. The first one would be uh, this one, which is a crane fly, uh, which I'll share with you just now. So this is a crane fly um, with a 60 millimeter macro and uh, 26 millimeters worth of extension tubes, automatically bracketed 250 shots and then processed in a stacking software called Helicon Focus. Uh, and the detail that we can achieve from here is pretty phenomenal as well. Uh, and, and then another good example of that uh, would be exactly the same setup, but this one would be now working with um, perhaps only 160 shots, I think is what this one was. Um, and it would be this one here, which is the wasp uh, on the side there. Uh, and the lighting on the first hoverfly was the STF-8. The lighting on this one is two Olympus FL 900 flashes used with some diffusion uh, and the detail we can get there again is pretty substantial so huge amounts of um of possibilities with the with the macro stuff even if you don't want to get all the extras you want to do a single macro shot uh then we've got some really excellent single ma single macro shots that i can share with you as well um I am blessed with a massive love for animals and the weirder the better. So we do have some quite exotic ones. Uh, this is a baby crested gecko. Uh, he was tiny in this one. His, his head, so from the jawline to the tip of his tongue that is flicking out there, was approximately 12 millimeters. So 1.2 centimeters. Um, and you can see there the detail that you can get mm. from that. And that's a single shot. That's not stacked. It's just on the 60 millimeter at f5.6. So the the in terms of the quality of the equipment, it is uh, absolutely phenomenal. David, on the demonstration that you did with the lichen shot, with the um, the final one that you did, was you were you using um, a tripod for that, or were you hand holding? 
No, I was on a tripod for that one. So I had a, my main tripod. I have a Benro tripod that I was on for that one. So it's all quite secure. Um, now you can handhold focus stacking when you're not using flash. Uh, so I can probably give you a little bit of an example now if you have a second to let me put the camera back on. Oh, no, I can't show you because I need to put the cable in. It doesn't work like that. But ultimately, yes, you can handhold a focus stack providing your shutter speed can go above 150th of a 160th of a second if you can get 160th or higher you can definitely handheld a focus stack up to 10 11 shots great thank you is everybody happy very yep yeah. excellent that's the aim so good i'm glad i hope everybody enjoyed that. We, we do have a competition coming up in the new year called little things so ah, he's got there you lots go. of ideas and lots of knowledge now on how to get some really good shots. They'll have to buy an Olympus camera. <laughs> oh, before I go, I have to say, uh, I do have a little bit of a Brucey bonus. We all love a Brucey bonus. So I've got the discount code for you. Get the pen and paper ready. Now, the code cannot, I've got to be absolutely clear about this, the code cannot be used on a 100 to 400 lens that's currently out but still being fulfilled we'll or a 150 to 400 lens either so on those two lenses the code just will not work okay uh but if you want to buy something through the olympus shop uh, olympus direct at olympus.co.uk if you enter the code club all in capitals c l u v 2020 at the checkout that will take 10 percent off your total order no matter how much you buy uh, and that, as as you can probably guess, is valid until the end of the year. Uh, and then if it moves over into the 1st of January, that will no longer be valid. All right. I'll, I'll send your email and that code out to everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody in the club is more than welcome to use that. If anybody has any problems using that code, get in touch with me straight away and I'll make sure that I fix it for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Good night. Good Thank night. you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Thank Bye. you very much, David. Bye, everybody. Welcome. Take Bye. care. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Sal. David, are you still there? Oh. oh.